Hello to all of my Bronze Age comic book geeks, Dante D here, and welcome to the channel, the podcast, where we talk about comic books and other geek stuff. Today, we're going to be talking about something very special, to me anyway, because as you probably all know, I am also, in addition to being a Marvel and DC fan, a huge Star Wars fan, and... Since Marvel has taken over Star Wars again, I believe it happened in 2015, uh, I feel that they've been doing a great job with the franchise, believe it or not. I know a lot of people kind of hate on Disney Star Wars, and not all of the feedback with the new Star Wars comics coming out of Marvel have been great, but I personally have to say uh, I really enjoy them. I enjoy them so much that it actually inspired me to go back to the original Star Wars comics from Marvel uh, in, that happened actually in the um, in the late 1970s, around the time that the original Star Wars films uh, were released. And I really kind of felt compelled to do an episode about this because I feel that a Star Wars fan who didn't grow up with these, uh, these original Star Wars uh, comics Probably, if they were to look at these today, they would look back and be like, mm, that's that, that's not Star Wars. So much looks different in these original Star Wars comics. And I, I just feel that a fan who didn't grow up with these would really just kind of write these off uh, as just being, you know, legends or, you know, just being nonsense and not really important to the uh, the overall Star Wars uh, mythos, let's say. So that really got me thinking, did these original Marvel Star Wars stories, these original Marvel Star Wars comics, did they suck? Were they, were they not really good at all? Should a Star Wars fan just completely write these off? That is exactly what we're going to be talking about today and what we're going to kind of be uh, unpacking and discussing and trying to figure out if if this is actually really going to be worth your time. But in order to do that, we have to go all the way back to the beginning. Around the time in 1977 when the original Star Wars film debuted. George Lucas, in order to promote the Star Wars film, he thought it would be a great idea to have a comic book company do a promotional comic book to kind of stir up some hype around the Star Wars film because he personally did not think that Star Wars was going to be a success. Uh, he, he, you know, because up until this point, uh, I think overall science fiction kind of sucked. I mean, at least in my opinion, uh, I know true hardcore science fiction fans out there would probably disagree with me, but I have to say I'm I'm not a true science fiction fan. Uh, the only science fiction type uh, franchise that I like really is Star Wars, and I have to say I do like Planet of the Apes and Star Trek. It just I, I feel like you need a lot of patience to get into Star Trek. I never I, I never was able to get uh, in, into Star Trek. And I feel like that's how a lot of people in the uh, 1970s felt about science fiction. And that's probably something that George Lucas knew. But he was determined to find a way to get this film, to get people excited about the film. So he, f he went to Marvel Comics, actually, because he felt that Marvel Comics was probably the best company around at the time to take on this project and i'm sure uh, that he saw how marvel handled the conan the barbarian license in their comics and thought that likely marvel could do the same thing with the star wars license because uh, if you know a little bit about comic book history conan the barbarian around this time was one of marvel's hottest selling books i do not believe conan Correct me if I'm wrong if you know about this, because I, I don't know, but uh, I think Conan was at a point where it was almost outselling Spider-Man, but I don't think it actually got there. I think it got pretty close. Correct me if I'm wrong. 
Uh, so George Lucas thought that, you know, maybe the same thing could happen with Star Wars comics. Well, Stan Lee actually had a meeting with the Lucasfilm people and uh, he actually declined. He shot them down. He didn't think that it was a good idea for Marvel to take on another licensed property. He, he just, he didn't care. He didn't care for the idea. So it actually took Roy Thomas to convince Stan Lee to uh, actually take on this project. And this, this didn't happen on the same day. This actually happened a little while after uh, because I think Roy Thomas was like, friends with a friend of someone who was in Lucasfilm or something like this. If you know the specific details, please let me know. But uh, basically, he ended up seeing the storyboards for Star Wars uh, with uh, with the original art by Ralph McQuarrie. And he was just, his jaw dropped. He thought the idea was amazing. And he thought it would be awesome to do a comic book. He thought there was really something to this the Star Wars thing, right? So he went back to Stan, and to make a long story short, he convinced Stan Lee to take on the Star Wars property. And of course, Stan gave the project to Roy Thomas and the now legendary uh, Howard Shaken, uh, who at the time I don't believe was a really well-known artist. Again, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I think Howard Shaken is actually best known for uh, his work on Star Wars. And it's at this point when I'm looking at the history that I really feel that the Star Wars comics played an integral role in making Star Wars the success it is today. Because the first few issues of uh, Star Wars, the first six issues were actually an adaptation of the original uh, 1977 A New Hope film. And the first three issues had come out uh, already by the time the film actually hit the theaters. So people had some time to kind of get, get excited about this, especially comic book fans, right? And, uh, you know, when the film came out, it just became a success. And I do feel that these comic books kind of got people excited about the Star Wars film and left them wanting more. After they saw the film, they're like, wow, this is actually pretty good. And they were relying on Marvel to give them their Star Wars fix because at the time they didn't know if there were there was going to be a sequel. Uh, it was Marvel that kept these stories, kept kept them going, really, and, and filled in the gaps between the films. So the first six issues, like I said, are just, just an adaptation of a new hope. And the, the art, I have to say as a person that didn't grow up with these comics, I think the art is good, but it looks a little awkward in areas. Like if you look at this, um, uh, and again, if you're listening to the podcast, you can probably pull up the image of, um, the cover to Star Wars number one. If you look at that cover of Star Wars number one, uh, like that Darth Vader helmet looks super, super awkward. <laughs> and it's green with yellow eyes. Luke's lightsaber is red. Uh, I mean, the art is well done, but there are just so many things in here that really look awkward and look foreign to uh, a fan who was watching Star Wars, who, a fan like me, really, that grew up with Star Wars in the 90s. So I got first exposed to Star Wars when the um, the special editions came out in uh, 1997. That was my first ex uh, exposure to Star Wars. I was around like 10 years old, I think, at the time. Um, so looking at that, it was just kind of like, eh, kind of weird. Even at the time, uh, you know, looking at this cover, I think I had been exposed to a few of these Star Wars comics from my cousin who collected comics, and I just thought that a lot of that, a lot of it looked weird and didn't really look like uh, what was in uh, the films. But nevertheless, uh, I, I do feel 
if you can kind of suspend your disbelief a bit, uh, the, I feel like the art is really, really well, well done. And the stories past the sixth issue, past the last issue of the, uh, adaptation, uh, I, I felt were actually really good. And I do feel that they are worth a fan's time. Now there's a lot of controversy actually with those, uh, those following issues after the, um, the adaptation because uh after issue number six the focus shifted actually to han solo and chewbacca and uh in a kind of like a solo part in the pun solo adventure that uh that they took uh, on a planet and uh they the controversy is actually surrounding the um the green carnivorous rabbit <laughs> so uh George Lucas and uh, the Lucasfilm team, they actually had to approve all of the uh, the issues and the stories before they actually went to print. And I could tell you from what I heard, George Lucas was not too happy to see a green carnivorous rabbit uh, when he opened up, I think it was either issue seven or eight. Uh, but I... I, he he really couldn't argue with sales because this comic book series was hot. It was selling like crazy. So, you know, he just, he kind of gave him a little bit of freedom uh, that way. And the story featuring Han Solo and Chewbacca, it kind of really reminded me of something you would see in, uh, in the Mandalorian. So they're on a kind of like a, a similar desert planet. Uh, they meet... They meet like this kind of Luke Skywalker looking character. Um, he's not Luke Skywalker, but he looks just like him. And even Han Solo says uh, at one point in in the story, like, hey, you kind of remind me of a kid named Luke. Uh, and then there's, there's a team of like mercenaries that Han Solo teams up with. And it kind of reminded me of um, that episode of The Mandalorian where they team up with all of the sand people to take down the crate dragon. It's just... It's really cool. I thought it was really well done, and it really kind of gave gives you that um, that Western feel, and that's what essentially Star Wars was supposed to be. It's supposed to be a space Western. So I really think that the writers at the time, like Roy Thomas at the time, he he took that idea and he thought, okay, let's actually try to make this more like a Western. I think they're trying to fight off like mercenaries that are. Uh, raiding the the villages and they're trying to take like their women and their resources and, and everything it was I thought the story was great and the following issues after the Han Solo arc were also amazing uh, you know again there there are some things that you have to do you, you do have to suspend your disbelief a bit because uh, around this time there was still a lot that was unknown about Star Wars. So for example, uh, it was not known that Jabba the Hutt was a slug. And Jabba the Hutt actually makes a lot of appearances in these uh, early issues um, of Star Wars. And he's he's more like a, like a humanoid, uh, really, really kind of weird looking. And uh, again, knowing my first exposure to Jabba the Hutt was with him being a slug, to see that was kind of funny. Uh, on top of that too, uh, all the lightsabers, all the original, like in these early issues, all the lightsabers were were red. And I thought that was really strange. But again, I don't think that uh, association with blue being for the, for the good side and red being for the bad side was really established yet. So they, they were just all red. <laughs> and they all, the way they were drawn too was kind of strange. I don't think it was until like maybe the 30th, Around the 30th issue um, of the original Star Wars run that you start seeing, you know, Luke's lightsaber being consistently blue, Darth Vader's lightsaber being consistently red. And uh, yeah, so there's just, just, just a lot here that you kind of have to put aside. If you can do that, if you can look at these stories through the eyes of someone in, you know, 1977, 1978, experiencing this and enjoying this uh I, I i'm telling you you'll you'll just love this and they, and they do an amazing job creating even some original characters like uh there is um 
there's a there's a character who's from the house of I don't even know if I'm saying this right the house of Tag T A G G E or Taga or whatever, um, and they're like a noble family that's involved with uh, the Empire and uh, the Baron of of Tag or whatever. He's he's like an ongoing villain in this, and uh, it, it, it it's great. And you kind of get to see these these adventures um, that take place after the films. And again, I know it's not canon; it's considered legends, but still fun to read, nevertheless. Like Luke gets sent off to uh, to find uh, a new base location for the for the rebels because they're afraid now that the Imperials know that the base is on Yavin Four that uh, they're they're going to retaliate. And it's just so many amazing stories. I have to tell you, the the whole thing where you only remember ten percent of uh, of what you read. I think that's true. Like I I I have tons of comics that I've read throughout my life, and uh, I, I to tell you the truth, I I can only remember a handful, and I can remember the ones that I've read multiple times. This Star Wars series here is is something that I I've only read this this. Um, this is volume one of the Epic Collection. I've only read volume one of the Epic Collection. I could probably tell you pretty much every story. I could summarize every story that happened in here. It was just really great and uh, really entertaining. And obviously the people back in 1977, 1978, they, uh, they were highly influenced by this because Star Wars became a huge hit for Marvel. And uh, I don't know if this is true, but I think kind of Stanley had to put his tail between his legs for this one because it got to the point where Star Wars actually became Marvel's best-selling book. Uh, to the point where it actually outs outsold Spider-Man at one point. The, the time that Star Wars was on top, I believe, was kind of short-lived, but there was a point uh when the original marvel star wars was outselling spider-man i i i just can't can't imagine that i can't believe it it's uh it's just crazy to think that and it's well known that star wars is actually the franchise franchise that saved marvel comics uh during this time because you know around 1977 1978 79 uh there was a recession going on uh, you know, people were losing their houses. Interest rates were flying through the roof. Like there wasn't a lot of disposable income for people. Right. So, um, and the people that were reading comics, I'm sure they had to be very choosy about the, the books that they, they were reading and the comic book industry was, was suffering hardcore during that time. DC was, uh, if you've ever heard of the DC implosion, uh, that this all happened around that time. And I feel that uh, Marvel was actually able to avoid these types of issues because of Star Wars. So unbelievable what kind of cultural influence this comic book series had, but also uh, the financial difference it made for uh, Marvel Comics at that time. But nevertheless, it wasn't all, uh, you know, flowers and happy times with respect to the Star Wars comic. Because, like I said at the uh, a little earlier on in this episode, all of the stories that were done by uh, the writers of Star Wars, they were uh, closely monitored by Lucasfilm, and Lucasfilm had to approve the stories before they actually went to print uh roy thomas actually believe it believe it or not stayed on the book for only a very short period of time uh he felt that he wasn't being paid enough for it he was getting paid peanuts to write star wars in comparison to some of the other books he was working on and then as as he uh puts it he felt like lucasfilm only allowed them to run in place with the story like they were never like he was just they were never able to advance the plot in star wars uh and and i and i get why because 
George Lucas wanted to keep his options open for the future films. You know, he didn't he didn't know exactly what was going on. And they had some very, very, you know, comics code like um comics code like uh you know standards that could not be broken. So for example, Roy Thomas and, and anybody writing or drawing this book, they were not allowed to do any stories about the force. They were not allowed to do any stories about the Jedi Knights. They were not allowed to uh, kind of expand on any uh, romance between either Han Solo and Leia or Luke Skywalker and uh, Leia. They couldn't really do, they were very limited in what they could do with Darth, Darth Vader. I think at the beginning, they weren't even letting letting them use Darth Vader as a villain in the stories. I think that's why they had to create that kind of, um, that, that Baron Tag uh, character, because, you know, they were very, very possessive uh, over, over the property, and they were very, very picky about what they could and could not do. So Roy Thomas said, forget this. I'm uh, I'm done with this. He moved on to other things. He he said like, you know, I'm I'm going to be always a fan of the films, but I don't I'm not interested in working on the book. You know, I'm I'm too restricted and I'm not getting paid enough. So, he moved on. Then uh Archie Goodwin actually took over and uh he did some great things with Star Wars. Same thing with uh, Carmen Infantino. Uh Howard Shaken, I think left around the same time as uh as Roy Thomas, then Carmen Infantino and uh, Archie Goodwin take over, and they were on the book for a very, very long time, and they they did some really great things. I'm at, I'm on actually uh, volume two of uh, of the ascent uh, the epic collection of all the Star Wars stories. Uh, I have five five uh, volumes. I'm on volume two right now. Can't wait. To, I just can't wait to get to the other ones because they're they're just uh, so good. Actually, Chris Claremont, uh, was a guest writer a few times with these Star Wars stories as well. And it was really well known at the time, actually, that Chris Claremont is a huge fan of Star Wars and was a huge fan of Star Wars. Uh, Mary Jo Duffy actually said I, the day after he came back from watching the film, he was like acting it out and getting on desks and, you know, trying like miming lightsabers and it was just uh she said it was really kind of kind of comical right then eventually i got to the point where mary joe duffy took over and she was on this book for a very long time and all the writers that worked on this book will tell you that they were extremely frustrated with the restrictions that Lucasfilm put on them and what they could and could not do with with the franchise and with their stories. Mary Jo Duffy was able to kind of look beyond it because she loved Star Wars so much and she, she worked on it for a long time. And uh, Marvel did adaptations for Empire Strikes Back in, in their main ongoing Star Wars title. And, uh, and then they did a separate adaptation of Return of the Jedi. It was like a limited series, I think, of like maybe five, five issues. And uh, it was after Return of the Jedi came out that Mary Jo Duffy got very, very frustrated because George Lucas actually said, you know, I think, I think I'm, I'm done with Star Wars. There aren't going to be any other films. So she was under the impression that she would actually have a little bit more freedom in what she could do with the stories now that the films were all wrapped up and uh she was wrong uh she was still very limited she still was not able to do stories about the jedi knights she, she wasn't able to expand on the uh the romance between han solo and leia uh, she wasn't able to mention in there that anybody in these stories that anybody else knew that uh, Luke Skywalker and Leia were, were twins and that Darth Vader was their father. Like she was super, super limited with all this. And she even got to a point where she had to create her own characters 
And then Lucasfilm was telling them what she could and couldn't do with her these characters that she created. And she was getting so restricted that it was getting to the point where these stories uh, were, weren't even looking like Star Wars stories. Uh, the, the quality declined significantly. And it wasn't Joe Duffy's fault at all. It's, it was the corporate hand of Lucasfilm that was really making it difficult for her to make this book as great as it, it, it could have been really finally 1986 rolls around and that was a dark day for star wars fans because with sorry that was a dark year rather uh for star wars fans because not only were the star wars fans not going to be getting any other movies at least so george lucas said but marvel decided to pull the plug on this on the whole star wars project uh, it was just it was just too difficult uh, for Marvel to to keep up. Joe Duffy wanted to keep doing the book, but Marvel decided, you know, let let's get let let's let's finish this up because uh, they wanted to focus more on their superhero books because that's actually what was selling at the time. So if you if you look back to your comic book history, 1986 was a watershed year in comics. Like DC was kicking butt. In 1986, that, that was the year where we got Dark Knight Returns and Watchmen. And Marvel had a lot of catching up to do. So superheroes were hot again. And Marvel's like, you know what? We, we need to respond to this Dark Knight, this Watchmen thing that DC's doing. Otherwise, they were going to be... They were going to be number two for a very, very long time. And Mar the, the execs at Marvel knew that Star Wars was not... Was not... Was done it wasn't going anywhere and it was not going to save the company. So they wanted to focus on these, these superhero books. And of course, again, we knew they knew that there likely weren't going to be any other films, but at the same time, George Lucas was making it difficult to write just in case he wanted to make some films. It was, it was just a mess. They were, they were, they were too wishy-washy and they got, they, they just, they canned the project and Joe Duffy years later, during the 90s comic book boom when dark horse took over the license and they started being able to do stories that really kind of examined the star wars universe that examined the jedi and just really uh did a a great job of carrying on the star wars story uh needless to say she was hurt and she was she was really upset about it but nevertheless uh even though the Star Wars uh, title was not as great in the later years as it was in, in, in the earlier years. Uh, the, the impact this title had on fans, I think, I cannot understate, or sorry, I cannot overstate how important this was. And I really think this comic made Star Wars the hit that it is today because not only did they get people excited for the first film but you have to think the hype just grew and grew and grew with each leading up to each film so new hope comes out all these fans are reading all these star wars films or sorry are reading all these star wars comics leading up to empire strikes back that was released in 1980 that's three years of star wars comics these people are getting super super excited about Star Wars. Same thing after Empire Strikes Back with that huge cliffhanger that it ended on with Han Solo and Carbonite and shipped off to Jabba the Hutt. I had all those stories leading up to that. People wanted to know what was going to happen, you know? So it was just uh, super exciting. And that hype, that hype never went away. People loved Star Wars. Not only because of the movies, but also because of this comic uh again i highly recommend picking it up amazing uh they are collected in the uh the epic collection the uh, these epic collections there are five volumes uh the fifth volume does not does not go up to the uh, the end of the series uh like this this original star wars run i believe it ran for 106 or 107 issues 
And uh, I believe the fifth volume of the Epic Collection uh, only collects up to maybe 80-something or 90-something. Uh, I honestly don't think they will collect those final issues of, uh, of Star Wars in an Epic Collection just because uh, they weren't among the best issues of Star Wars. And again, I explained why. Just, it wasn't Joe Duffy's fault. It's just she was, she was so limited in, um, in what she could do. But highly recommend picking up, picking it up. Uh, again, you're going to have to suspend your disbelief a little bit. Uh, and as long as you don't mind watching Luke and Leia make out a couple times. <laughs> Actually, uh, no less. I'm, I'm on the second volume of the, uh, the Epic Collection. I'm almost finished it. And uh, in between the first volume and the second volume, I think they've made out probably no less than four times it's kind of funny but again i i can't uh i can't fault the writers at the time because again they 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 probably had no idea in their mind that it was going to turn out these these two were going to be twins and people nowadays uh they're probably kind of desensitized to that because the lannisters from game of thrones took it to a whole new level so i think you can you can deal with them kissing for for a few panels right <laughs> Uh, but yeah, it was just, it was hot. Uh, I also, I cannot fail to mention a star Wars weekly, uh, which was a series that, uh, was being printed in the UK. Marvel UK was dying, um, <laughs> as well. They were just like hemorrhaging money in the, uh, in the seventies and early eighties and and Star Wars Weekly was actually saving them. Uh, originally, Star Wars Weekly started off as these. Um, they started off as the the American issues, but divided into like three issues. So if one issue in America is like you know thirty two pages or whatever it is seventeen pages, uh, the the Marvel UK would uh, print maybe four or five pages at a time of that and just kind of make it more of a, of a weekly comic. So it would take four weeks to tell the story that, uh, one issue in one month over in the U S would. And then eventually they, they started doing some original stories too. And those, those are actually collected in here. Um, the Marvel, the Marvel UK stories are actually all in, um, they're in, they're in black and white. Uh, they were in black and white and it was, it was kind of a cool magazine. They, they would have the story and then they would have, uh, you know, like these, these, these articles about like some of, they would do some highlights on some of the actors from the star Wars movies. Um, they would fe feature some other backup stories like guardians of the galaxy, anything from Marvel that was kind of related to, to sci-fi. So, um, huge impact star Wars had on the comic book industry, uh, but also huge impact the comic books had on star Wars fandom and, uh, and the star Wars franchise in general. So if you haven't read these, you're missing out, pick these up. Uh, they are collected in Epic collections. Again, there are five volumes to my knowledge. Uh, I have all of them and they're, they're amazing. Um, on volume two right now, again, I'm going to get through the other ones probably rather quickly. They are also collected in, uh, two omnibuses. I believe, uh, I believe the omnibuses at the time of this recording are out of print. Uh, but again, Marvel constantly reprints omnibuses every few, few years. They'd be foolish not to, um, actually had some uh, viewers and listeners on the uh, of um, of the show here kind of complaining to me they're like because I did a review back way back when on uh, the amazing spider-man omnibus volume ones maybe like two three years ago and uh, people are like you know I can't find this anywhere and th the ones that are you know for sale are they're super super expensive but uh believe it or not it's being reprinted. I honestly think they reprint these omnibuses every three, four years. So just have to be patient if you want the omnibus anyway. But if uh, if you're okay with the Epic collections, which which are a little bit more portable, uh, I would definitely recommend picking uh, picking those up. I will link all that in the in the episode description, so um, so you can pick them up if you're if you're interested in those. 
So I'd like to hear from you all. What did you think of Marvel, the original Marvel Star Wars? Did you think it sucked? Did you think it was amazing? I personally think it was amazing, but I would love to hear your opinion on this. Uh, love interacting with you as always. And you can reach out to me either in YouTube comments. Uh, if you're listening to the podcast, you can reach out to me on Twitter, Instagram, or Tumblr. Till next time, this is Dante D signing off. Thank you for joining me all. Uh, really appreciate everyone's support. I will see you all in the next episode.